we are looking at an interesting stomach up here. And for some reason, they stuck an ovary in here. I have no idea why they put an ovary next to this thing. But uh, probably the uh, history, in fact, uh, I know what the history was on the exam. It said it was a 52-year-old woman with weight loss and epigastric distress. She had a uh, upper uh, uh, gastrointestinal series, and they noted on it that the stomach did not move. It did not peristalse. And then she died, and then they put this up here, and they put this ovary over here, and they wanted you to put it together. Anybody know why this stomach did not move? Because it's linitis plastica. The patient has an adenocarcinoma of the stomach, and it's a unique type of adenocarcinoma in the stomach in that the cells that are, are invading the wall of the entire stomach are called signet ring cells. Now this is a special stain. This is a mucicarmine stain, and the mucin's pink. Now signet ring is like a ring, okay, in a sense like a diamond ring. Okay, and so here the diamond is the nucleus that's been pushed to the periphery. Okay? And then the mucus is in here making it look like the cell is empty. And so the nucleus is pushed to the to to the to the uh, periphery, just kind of like it is in fatty change in the liver, except these are malignant neoplastic glandular cells. And they call them signet ring. And these are very characteristic of linitis plastica type of gastric adenocarcinoma. Now here's another misconception that we see in this country versus other countries in their pathology courses, and that's Kruckenberg tumors. I believe, at least it's been true for every other group I've taught and I've talked to, uh, to students from other countries, that you were taught that Kruckenberg tumor, uh, where the gastric cancer is involving the stomach, was seeding. It's not. It's hematogenous spread. Okay, so it's not a gastric adenocarcinoma that is just seeding out and it's just somehow, you know, falling on the ovaries and then invading it from that. That is totally incorrect. It's hematogenous spread to the ovary. There's a lot of reasons why that, what you're, many of you were taught, is incorrect. One, why would it just pick the ovaries and not hit the omentum on the way down and you don't see omental metastasis at all? So that's, that would be right against it right away. It would just, I mean, it just stands up there and just goes like that and just hits those ovaries, not a chance. Not to mention the fact that if seeding was the answer, then the cancer cells would be in the outside invading in, and yet when you take sections through these ovaries, the entire thing is, uh, is totally uh, replaced by cancer. It's hematogenous. It's not an example of seeding. Okay. I can tell you how they put the exam, guys. They'll give you the exact history I just gave you. They'll maybe show a growth of the stomach, and they'll say they'll show the bio ovary, and they'll see this is a biopsy of the ovary. Okay? And you see signet rings. There is no such thing as a, uh, a signet ring adenocarcinoma of the ovary. It doesn't exist. There isn't any primary cancer of the ovary that looks like this. Okay, this is a, this is, these signet ring cells came from a stomach cancer that has metastasized to the ovaries. Usually both of them, that's called Kruckenberg's tumor. It's a favorite question on boards. Favorite, favorite question on boards. Now most, fortunately, most cancers of the stomach are not like that. Most of them are ulcerated type of lesions and lesser curvature in the pylorus and antrum. That's what most of them look like. This one's kind of an unusual variant where it can actually diffusely infiltrate through the wall of the stomach, and it's, it's like, a, uh, like a leather bottle. You've heard also leather bottle stomach. You could probably sit on this thing and it wouldn't collapse. I mean, it's that, it's that um, hard from this infiltration of these cancer cells and fibrous tissue response to it. Gastric cancer in this country is actually declining. I think a lot of it relates to treatment of H. pylori infections, you know, with triple therapy. Uh, where, but however, in other countries, it's the primary cancer. Could you name what country where it's the primary cancer? Japan. And it relates to the, it relates to the, uh, smoked products. It's, you know, barbecues are really not a good idea, actually, because there's carcinogens in smoke. Now, if it's gas, then that's not a problem, but if you're talking about charcoal, then basically you're putting carcinogens in the meat. Okay, so it seems to be more common in, um, in Japan because of smoked uh, uh, fish and different kinds of things. And they like you to know those kind of uh, ethnically oriented cancers like like uh, nasal pharyngeal carcinoma, China, okay, uh, stomach cancer, uh, Japan, 
Uh, also, they get HTLV-1 uh, T-cell malignant lymphomas in Japan, uh, a little bit more common. Uh, those kinds of things, Burkitt's lymphoma in you know, Africa, those kinds of things. They enjoy asking those kinds of questions. Oh, by the way, if there was a, uh, a, 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 a non-tender mass in the left supraclavicular area, then patient that had uh, epigastric distress and weakness, what would be your first choice? Metastatic gastric adenocarcinoma. Okay, that would be new. That's not to say it's the only thing. Did you know that cervical cancer can also metastasize to the left supraclavicular node? It can. See, the left supraclavicular node drains abdominal organs. The right supraclavicular node doesn't. So lung cancers go to, to right usually, not usually to left. So left, that's the importance of the left supraclavicular node. It drains down here, not up here. And so cancers down there can come up and, 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 uh, and involve it. Pancreatic cancers can metastasize there too. But when you add it all up, it's stomach that wins. Okay, that's enough on that. Now we get to the very interesting part, probably the most important part of GI because it involves an integration with phys, physiology. That's malabsorption. Malabsorption, very, very important as you know about malabsorption. Mal means abnormal or bad absorption. Okay, of what? Everything. Fats, carbs, and proteins. But by uh, diagnosis point of view, it's we hone in on the inability to reabsorb fats. And we, that's how we usually diagnose malabsorption with stools for fat, looking for uh, increase in fat in the stool, which is called steatorrhea. Okay, so not a very nice test to do, sending a, a stool sample to the to the laboratory because most of the time it gets lost. Okay, I can't imagine how something like that would get lost, but it always gets lost, especially uh, 72 hour stool collections, which you probably have to bring in a wheelbarrow. I don't know how something like that gets lost, but somehow stool samples get lost. <laughs> they get lost. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. You can send it by FedEx, you can send it by anyone, and it gets lost. It's just plain lost. Okay, no one likes working with stool. And it's a, uh, uh, but that is absolutely essential for making a diagnosis. You have to have an increase in fat and stool to make that as a screening test for malabsorption and steatorrhea. So let's get into that. Let's just get into fat digestion, and then we can easily understand malabsorption of fat. One, you need lipases to break fat down into fat into fatty uh, into two monoglycerides and fatty acids, as you know. So we need a functioning pancreas. Two. We need villi in the small intestine. Why? Because actually, if we didn't have villi, we'd probably have a small intestine about one mile long. Okay? We'd be carrying it. We would have to have extra fee of our, uh, of our abdominal wall. We'd have to be absent, eagle syndrome, I guess that is. And we'd be carrying our small intestine in front of us. So God in his infinite wisdom said, we don't want to do that to my people. And so why don't we just increase the absorptive surface by putting villi there? Okay? And by doing that, you increase the overall absorptive surface without increasing the length. Isn't that cool? All right, so that's the purpose of villi. So if you don't have them, then for you decrease the absorptive surface, then you're not able to reabsorb the monoglycerides and fatty acids, and therefore you lose them. Okay, so you need, you need uh, a functioning uh, uh, small intestine with villi. And third, you need something to emulsify the fat and break it up into tiny, tiny little particles called micelles, which are about a micron uh, in uh, diameter. So you need bile salts to emulsify. Emulsifying agents are what many times are in dishwash, dishwashers, okay? And to get fat off of plates and stuff like that, they use emulsifying agents, okay? And that's basically what bile salts do. You have to see Dawn soap work. Uh, I mean, if that would be that would be just like just like a bile salt or bile acid would work. You just try it sometime. Put in a, a water there. Put some Dawn soap. Put some fatty plates in there, and you'll just watch the fat come right to the surface, and then suddenly they'll break up from big lobules into tiny small ones. It's breaking it up, emulsifying it. That's what bile salts do. So you get tiny, 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 tiny little droplets that are one micron, called micelles, and it's easy to absorb them. So, in, in summary, we need a functioning pancreas, we need bile salts, and we need a, a small intestine that has villi in order to uh, reabsorb fat. That, understand that? Okay. Let's brainstorm bile salts, please. Where are they made? Liver from cholesterol. 
Cholesterol cannot be degraded. Cholesterol either is uh, solubilized in bile, then you run the risk of cholesterol stones, or it's converted into bile salts, bile acids. You cannot break down cholesterol. So, liver disease can produce bile salt deficiency. Because it's in bile, anything obstructing bile flow will produce bile salt deficiency. Uh, third, if you have bacterial overgrowth, they love salts, they can eat them, they can break them down. Four, you can have terminal ileal disease. Crohn's disease, and you can't recycle them. That would decrease them. Five, you can take cholestyramine, bile acid resins, for treating your hyperlipidemia and produce bile salt deficiency. In fact, that's what they want to do. You ever wonder about how cholestyramine works in lowering cholesterol? You purposely make them bile salt deficient by binding them and restricting them. Why? Because if you're not recycling, you've got to make more. In fact, the board question is going to be, what's happening in the liver? Answer, upregulation of LDL receptor synthesis is the answer. Because if you have to make more bile salts because the cholesterol made you deficient in them, then you need to make more. That means you're going to have to suck more out of the, out of the, uh, out of the blood, so you're going to have to upregulate, means make more LDL receptors, and that's what you do. And they take the cholesterol out of your blood and lower it so that you can make more bile salts. It's clever, very clever, but it's kind of messy because it's, uh, you know, it's very upsets you. And plus, uh, the, the cholestyramine, second, it takes drugs with it. That's also a board question. So if you've got a person on digitalis, it's going to take that with it and many, many other things along with it, too. And so it can, it's not very good for people that are taking other medications because you can lose them in the stool along with your bile salts. Right? Okay. So let's deal with some diseases. Uh, we already said that the screening test of choice for malabsorption is the stool for fat. Let's say it's positive. So we have to figure out where are these three areas is it, is it, is it due to? Is it pancreatic deficiency, alcoholic, let's say? Is it due to bile salt deficiency, or is it due to something wrong with the small bowel? Overall, small bowel wins. And here it is right here. And I did this purposely, guys, because it was on your boards. I have a picture of the small bowel uh, lesion here and a skin zit that has a relationship with this. And I'd like you to tell me what disease this is and what, the, uh, what that skin zit is. This is celiac disease, okay, and that's dermatitis herpetiformis. There's a relationship of dermatitis herpetiformis with the autoimmune disease called celiac disease. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disease against uh, gluten and wheat, specifically gliadin. It's a, it's a portion of gluten. It's very common, guys, witness the fact that it is the most common cause of malabsorption in this country. And so what happens is if you take wheat type of products and you eat them, and the gluten gets reabsorbed into the villi, and you have antibodies against gliadin, which you do, as also against anti-endomycial antibodies, is another one, uh, then you get destruction of the villi. Just like you have antibodies against parietal cells or intrinsic factor, I mean, it destroys everything around it. Okay, so these autoantibodies are attacking the gluten, which you just reabsorbed from your food. It's going to destroy the villi. So there's no villi here. It's flat. The villi should have been up here. It's flat. So you're not able to reabsorb fats or proteins or carbohydrates. There's no villous surface. But notice the, the glands underneath are fine. It's, they're fine. It's just that the villi are absent. And it's a 100% association with dermatitis herpetiformis with underlying celiac disease. Now, I thought, and I always taught, that that's a part two concept because it's always on that. But one lady in, uh, in New York, actually, told me, he said, Dr. Glenn, my test, I had a dermatitis herpetiformis with someone that was malabsorbing fat. I said, no kidding. And so was, that was a part one exam. So they, they think it's worth the part one, too. Okay, now herpetiformis gives you the idea of herpes. It's not herpes. Okay, it's also an autoimmune type of disease involving skin. But it gives you an idea that it's a vesicular lesion, you know, vesicles. And I think you can see these are vesicles here. So it kind of looks like herpes of the skin except it's called dermatitis herpetiformis. And then they, they talk about something like this or show you this picture, and they say, you know, what's the cause of the diarrhea? The answer is antibodies against uh, gluten or gliadin. Okay, that's your diagnosis. Okay, another cause which is rare is called Whipple's, Whipple's disease. Whipple's disease is actually an infection. Uh, of the small intestine. It's due to uh, an organism that you can't gram stain. In fact, you can only see by electron microscopy. And this is an electron microscopy from a patient with Whipple's, and you can see what looked like bacteria. 
and they're basically defective rods of, uh, so they call it trochoferma whippoli. Okay, so you can't actually gram stain this thing. You can't culture it. You can only see it by EM. But when you do the histology of a patient that has whipples, uh, you'll see flat, blunt villi, and you look in a lamina propria, there's these very foamy-looking macrophages in there, and that's the key that makes you think that they may have whipples, is these foamy. In fact, they kind of look like the Nemon pick thing. Remember those bubbly little things? They kind of look like that. And any pathologist that sees these little foamy things know, knows that it's a potential for whipples, but they also know if it was an HIV-positive person, it's a potential for something that looks like whipples, but isn't. This is an acid fast stain over here on your right. In an HIV positive person with a 100 uh, helper T cell count. Okay? And, and it looked like this uh, initially. There's a like the foamy macrophages. This is an acid fast stain, and you can clearly see that those macrophages are acid, acid fast particles, namely. Mycobacterium avium intracellulare. Did you know that's more common than MTB? This is Mycobacterium avium intracellulare that has produced a Whipple's-like syndrome with malabsorption. Important. 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 Now, Whipple's being an infection has systemic signs and symptoms. There is fever. There is polyarthritis. There is generalized painful lymphadenopathy. There's a peculiar color to the skin. Usually these are males. And so it's systemic. And so you say, this looks like an infection. And it is. And actually, if it truly is due to trochoferma, okay, you can actually treat them with antibiotics a long time, and it'll go away. So every now and then, they throw, part, they throw that one uh, in on the exam. Uh, so there's two diseases that are of the intestine that can produce malabsorption, celiac disease and Whipple's disease. Other diseases, as I've suggested, would be diseases of the pancreas. We're basically talking about chronic pancreatitis, and who's that more common in? Alcoholics. So if an alcoholic has malabsorption, I can think of two reasons for why they would have malabsorption. Can you? One obvious is, is that they, they're the most common cause of chronic pancreatitis, so that could be one reason. But what would be another reason? Would they not have cirrhosis? And if they had cirrhosis, what else could they have? Mild salt deficiency. So it could be either a bile salt deficiency related to cirrhosis or uh, a light taste deficiency related to chronic pancreatitis or both in a patient that has, that has an alcoholic. Understand? So this is how you think. If you know where things are made and you know what, what alcoholics have, cirrhosis, pancreatitis, you're able to put these kinds of things together. And that's what the boards expect you to do. And they don't expect you to, to vomit out information. They're not interested in that. They're interested, can you put things together? That's what they're interested in. That's how they construct their questions. Okay. I think that's about it for that. Let's talk about my favorite subject, diarrhea. If you think I'm bad on, on nose picking, you would have seen me on diarrhea. <laughs> but we won't get bad because we're, we're time constraints prevent me from going berserk on diarrhea. The best way of thinking about diarrhea is to subdivide it into three types. That's that GI people might put it into five because they're GI, so they got to do, they got to make their money for their, so they got to, you know, subdivide, the subdivide, the subdivide. But actually, diarrhea can be can be put under three headings: invasive, and it means exactly what it says, the bacteria invade; secretory. That means exactly what it says. The bacteria produce a toxin that stimulates cyclic AMP or other mechanisms, causing the small bowel to uh, secrete excess amounts of isotonic fluid, which is sodium chloride. Okay? Or it can be osmotic. That's my absolute favorite one, which almost all of you have and none of you will admit. That's, of course, lactase deficiency. So that, but there are other things for osmotic diarrhea. Laxatives can produce it too, and other types of uh, inborn errors of metabolism. Now, secretory and osmotic, let's just trick, uh, knock those off right, right off the bat, uh, are both high-volume diarrheas, and you go frequently, whereas invasive diarrhea is a low-volume diarrhea. Now, one of the very best, best tests to initially get in a patient with diarrhea is a, is a fecal a smear for leukocytes. Absolute single best, cheapest test you can do. It's kind of like the reticulocyte 
in a patient with anemia, you've got to do a reticulocyte count. You have diarrhea, you've got to do a fecal smear of stool because if there aren't any neutrophils in it, you don't worry about it. Because you know it's not invasive, you don't have to culture it, you know it's either going to be secretory or, uh, or uh, osmotic, and eventually it'll go away. So you don't even worry about it. Okay? But if there are uh, uh, inflammatory cells in it, you're obligated to culture it, and you know that it's going to be things like Campylobacter, Shigella, or something like that that's causing it. So that's the cheapest way of starting to work it up. Okay? Osmotic diarrhea means exactly what it says. And it fits the same thing we were talking about with osmosis, with water movements. Okay? It means that there's some osmotically active substance in the bowel lumen that's sucking water out of the, out of the bowel, causing a high-volume, hypotonic loss of fluid. That's what it is. So if you're lactase deficient, now remember, lactase is a disaccharidase. It's a brush border enzyme. So they can give you a classic history for lactose intolerance, and you will not see lactase deficiency down as an answer. But you will see disaccharidase enzyme deficiency, or you may see brush border enzyme deficiency. But you may not see the actual specific diagnosis, lactase deficiency. Are you with me on that? And that's very important. They can take something that's incredibly simple, and you know the answer, but you don't know that it's a disaccharidase and it's a brush border enzyme, and you're screwed. So what happens if you're lactase deficient, okay, then any uh, dairy product which contains lactose, which uh, breaks down into what, glucose and galactose, okay, can't be digested. And so it goes down to the colon, and that's like dessert for the anaerobic bacteria there. They start eating that sucker, and it releases gases, hydrogen gases, and acids, and all kinds of things. So you get an acidy stool, and it's the hydrogen gas that causes the bloating, distension, and incredible, explosive diarrhea. I can vouch for that. I can vouch for that. Okay. All right, so that's osmotic. Now, secretory, the two things you want to know for that are, of course, cholera, due to Vibrio cholerae, l tor strain, and of course, <laughs> you're trying to get out of fast, seeing that it was 20 after 10 for my coffee. <laughs> oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, I didn't put my black belt on today. I put my brown belt, but I'm really black belt. That's what it's all about, right? Just the color of your belt? <laughs> oh, nuts. <laughs> I was just telling everybody what I am. Brown belt today, tomorrow might be black belt. Who knows? By the way, I have changed my pants, even though they're the same thing. I know you've been counting. You've been saying this is his fourth day with the same set. No. As a matter of fact, this morning I changed it, but the underwear, two days. Why? Because you can't tell whether I've changed them. <laughs> just want to make sure that I know that women get very upset. God almighty. <laughs> That's like a no-no with women. Who no, knew? No. My wife. Oh, oh, I want to talk about my wife. <laughs> about my wife. God Almighty. Another thing that determines whether you have a white chromosome or not is this: <laughs> when food drops on the floor. A Y chromosome will pick it up and eat it. A woman would not even think of doing something like that. That gets thrown away. My wife is unbelievable. I know I'm eating something, a couple things, a couple peas or something like that. Falling I go down there, I get it before the door gets it, you know. So I just grab it and... Did you, did, did you just eat that on the floor? The dog was just there. Yeah. There's bugs on it. Sweetheart, there's bugs in you? No. Yes. You are just basically a giant bug. You've got bugs everywhere. They're on your skin. There's bugs in your mouth. No. Listen, what do you think? You're absolutely sterile? No. Okay. So what? So there's bugs on it. Okay. Big deal. Still, that doesn't matter. Throw it away. Throw it away. Nope. I get it in my mouth before she gets it. 
A clear-cut difference between Y chromosome and two X's. There is no doubt about that. All right. So, the other one's traveler's diary, enterotoxigenic E. coli. You better know all the, all the toxin E. coli, guys. All of them. I think I got them listed in my notes there, but you make sure that you know enterohemorrhagic is, of course, the 0157.87, enteroinvasive, enterotoxigenic. That's traveler's diarrhea. That is not an invasive diarrhea, nor is cholera. As a matter of fact, if you do a bowel biopsy in a patient with cholera and traveler's diarrhea, it's totally normal. There is not one iota of inflammation. It's purely a toxin that activates a pump. It's either cyclic AMP or some other pump. Guanylate cyclase is the one that traveler's diarrhea uses. Cyclic AMP is the one that Verbio uses. That's all it is. It's not like Clostridium difficile producing pseudomembranes. No, 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 no. All it does is stimulate a pump. That's all. Perfectly normal. That's secretory diarrhea. And remember, when you, give, when you give a fluid replacement to patients with cholera, it's got to have glucose. Why does it have to have glucose in it? Because you need glucose to be able to co-transport with the sodium that you put in that, that, uh, that fluid. Okay, very important that you remember that. Now, in my, my uh, readings, and I use lots of different sources, the most common invasive bacterial infection in the United States is Campylobacter jejuni. Shigella is a close second, but isn't number one. Okay, number one is Campylobacter. The way they'll ask it is they'll say, talk about a person with a low volume diarrhea, maybe with some blood in it. And they'll say they do, they do a, a stain on it, grand stain is in a comma-shaped or S-shaped organism. That's, uh, that's Campylobacter jejuni. That's how they do it. Okay. All right. Got a couple pictures. Actually, this is what Shigella looks like. Shigella can produce pseudomembranes, by the way, so can Campylobacter. So all that pseudomembrane is not necessarily C. difficile. This is actually Shigella. But what I wanted to show you are... Uh, three, two things. I'm going to show you a better picture of that amoeba histolytica when we deliver. This, of course, you know, is an owl eye that moves. That's Giardia. So where was this patient? St. Petersburg, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. Only kidding. Only kidding. No, this patient could be anywhere in the United States, especially up in the mountains. That's one of the reasons why you purify water in your mountains. It's just all the streams in the mountains are full with Giardia. And, that, and, say, and it's the most common cause of chronic diarrhea due to a parasite in the United States. Is Giardia lamblia treatment, please? Metronidazole. All right. Now, this is the one they really like. This is the most, com most common organism associated with uh, AIDS diarrhea. That's, of course, Cryptosporidium, Cryptosporidium parvi. Cryptosporidium is a partially acid-fast organism. That's what they have. Here's how they serve. They say you got a patient that has AIDS or has diarrhea, and uh, they say that there's an organism they find that, that whose oocyst is partially acid-fast. They're just basically giving it away. That's cryptosporidium. Guys, it'll kill you if you're immunosuppressed. It's really the treatment for it is almost worthless. But you know, Milwaukee. Uh, had it contaminating, and that was on the boards too, con their whole water supply. Now, most of the people recovered from it, but those that were HIV positive died because of the fact that in them, when they're immunocompromised, it will kill you. So it's very, very common, and remember, it's partially acid-fast oocyst, and you'll get cryptosporidium. It comes in, guys, right at the end when your helper T cell counts around 50 or 75. Then the, then, then the, then the final things that are going to kill you come in. Mycobacterium avium intracellulari comes in then. The cryptosporidium starts coming in then. Toxoplasmosis starts coming in then. And our little friend cytomegalovirus starts coming in then when you're 50 to 75. They're the dudes that knock you off. Okay. Pneumocystis carini is when you're up in the 200s. Okay. All right. So this is cryptosporidium parvi. Notice it just sticks on the surface of the colon, and that's it. This is a, you'd have to have history for this, so they probably say this is an autopsy specimen from an older woman that was in the hospital with a pneumonia, and she developed a diarrhea. This is what was found at autopsy. So you know if she had a pneumonia, she'd be on an antibiotic, and so I think it'd be reasonable enough to say that that would be pseudomembranous colitis. Now remember, what this is, is that taking an antibiotic that's wiping out the good guys and leaving behind Clostridium difficile. Everyone in this room has C. difficile in your stool. Everyone. 
except the E. coli and the Bacteroides fragilis are keeping it in check. But when you're on an antibiotic, most commonly anthocillin, not clindamycin, that's number two. Number one is anthocillin. Uh, when you're on an antibiotic for a period of time and you knock off the good guys and the bad guys, see, diphacil has a chance to proliferate and it makes toxins. And the toxins damage the, the superficial layers of the colon. It doesn't invade, the bacteria doesn't invade, the toxins do. So it's analogous to what other infection? Coronabacterium diphtheriae, which also has a toxin that damages and produces pseudomembranes, but the organism doesn't invade. Remember that ribosylation thing? And remember the uh, elongation factor 2 kind of thing is screwed up. You can, in other words, you can't elongate proteins. I've got to know everything there is to know about diphtheria toxins. Hopefully you're reading these high yields, guys. I hope you're not blowing these things off. The high yields in these notes are very high yield. Okay. You ask any ones that got the 92, 94, 97 about how they worked for them. Okay, and they were just telling me. I said, just like you said, Dr. Going. And I said, what about the high yields? Right. I mean, it was just easy. Boom, 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 boom. You just nailed them one right after the next. Okay? So I'm, I'm not kidding. Okay? I'm not bragging. I'm just saying what other people say. So don't, don't blow it off. There's some people that actually go to these things, take the test without reading the things. Then I see them again the next time. Then I ask them, why are you here? I didn't do too good. Did you read the high yields? Well, I didn't get all the way through them. There you go. There you go. Oh, by the way, what's your first step in management of this patient with pseudomembranous colitis? Toxin assay of stool. Not gram stain, because you all have that gram positive uh, rods there. No. Not blood culture, because it's not, it's not in your blood. You do a toxin assay of stool. That is the screening test of choice for C. difficile. Treatment, please. Metronidazole. For a while there, it was oral vancomycin, but what happened is they started getting resistant strains of Clostridium difficile, and they dropped it. And now we're back to metronidazole. See, metronidazole itself can cause pseudomembranous colitis. See, that's why they did it in favor of use vancomycin. Vancomycin doesn't produce pseudomembranous colitis, but it's expensive, and it produced resistant strains. So they went back to an antibiotic, which itself can produce the disease. But... You take that chance. <sighs> Diagnosis. Small bowel obstruction. It's the answer. Small bowel obstruction. It's just so classic, that's why it's on part one, two, and three. It's the stepladder effect, guys. You know about the air fluid levels with stepladder effect. Air fluid, air fluid, stepladder. Boonka, 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 boonka. Okay? It's obstruction. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. When you have a hollow viscous that peristalsis, you get a certain characteristic pain, and it's called colicky pain. Now, let me tell you what it isn't. It isn't like a crampy pain, you know, that, that, that you, you always have this kind of crampy pain, and there's no pain for intervals. That's just crampy pain. Colicky pain is pain, and an absolute pain-free interval, pain, and an absolute pain, no pain at all, and all of a sudden it comes again. And it doesn't have to be within minutes of each other. Sometimes it can be 15 minutes apart, 20 minutes apart, even an hour apart. That's colicky pain. It means total obstruction of the small bowel. Do they tell you that in the stem of the question? Sure. They say there's colicky pain. Duh. You know it's a, it's a complete obstructive lesion. By the way, the bile duct doesn't peristalse, so that's not really an exam. That's not colicky pain, it's crampy pain. It has to peristalse in order to produce that kind of pain. It has to move. And what it's doing is trying to move against an obstruction, and that's what's causing the pain. So it's pain, pain-free interval. Pain, pain-free interval. Don't forget that, because it gives away the answer. And so because they can't peristals, you end up with uh, the uh, ileus eventually, and it doesn't move at all, and so you get stagnation of the food wherever the obstruction is, proximal to it, and so you get air fluid levels, as you see here. All right. So distal to the area of obstruction, there is no air. Now, you know that in obstruction, there are two things that can happen. You can have constipation and obstipation. Now, constipation is where you just have a problem with stooling, okay? That doesn't mean obstruction. 
We just have a problem with stooling. Obstipation means you can't, not only do you have constipation, but you can't pass gas. That means you have complete obstruction. So you ask patients this. Have you had a bowel movement lately? No. Have you passed any gas lately with this kind of pain that you've been having? No. They're obstructed, guys. It just gave away the answer. So obstipation means constipation and you're not passing gas. God, I can't imagine my life without passing gas. Can you guys? Can you imagine a life without passing gas? <sighs> Unfortunately, I did it in my laboratory once when I thought it was totally empty. I mean, it was a big laboratory, bigger than this thing, and I just kind of looked around like this, and I had gas like up the was. I think I had a bronze shake, okay, and I had my lactase deficiency. I was like, I was like 20 weeks gestation. I swear to God, I was 20 weeks. And I, I really looked around and all that, and I said, oh, good. I went, mm. I mean, it was just horrendous. I have complete control of my sphincter. I can actually make sure that the liquid stuff doesn't come out of just the gas. I can complete, that's complete control. I, it requires great, 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 great training. And I have trained. My sphincter is so incredible, actually. My physician hates doing a rectal to check my prostate because I consider it fun to contract my sphincter so his finger doesn't come out. Okay. And I just love to see him screaming and screaming. I said, have you had enough? Yeah. It's that strong. Women have their Kegel-like exercises. I got mine, too, but it's my sphincter that I contract. All right. Having said all that, I got it all out. I was totally relieved, only to find out right behind me, which I didn't look, was a med tech. And her name was Flash. She not only has beautiful blonde hair, kind of like your hair, okay? And so I was going to turn around, and there's Flash. She had the reddest face. I mean, she was... <laughs> <laughs> what do you say with something like that? What can you possibly say to somebody? I'm sorry, you know? Or, you know, the usual thing, you look around, who did that? I mean, it's obvious who did that. It's obvious who did that. You can't get away with just saying, you know, showing like, that's, by the way, how you can tell who did it. The one that's really complaining the most is the dude that did it. It's always that. You know, so you just say, you did it, buddy. Oh, no, 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 it wasn't me. Yes, it was, because you're the one that's upset with it, aren't you? You're just trying to take the blame away from yourself, aren't you? Yes. Okay. All right, that got you way good. By the way, actually, all of that was true. Including the rectal exam. It was. Very powerful, but we don't need to demonstrate stuff like that. Okay. So, you see something like this, you know it's complete obstruction. So here we go, here we go, here we go. I must have put this out. Oh, this must be a put. I must have screwed up on putting this picture here. Why did I put this picture here when we're talking about obstruction? What does this poor child have? It has Down syndrome. Okay. Well, what if I told you I only had 46 chromosomes, though? You sure? You sure it's Downs? Hmm? It sure is. Because if you think that, that Downs is all trisomy 21, then you are really going to get screwed up. That's due to non-disjunction, as you know. Unequal separation in the first stage of meiosis. I heard someone say Robertsonian transla uh, translocation. You got the brains. That's correct. What it is is that there, this, uh, if this was 46 chromosomes, it was a kid, he would have 46 chromosomes, but one of those chromosome 21s would have another one attached to it. Okay, that's still counted as one. So, but you have three functioning chromosomes. And so you're still getting all the characteristics. That's called a Robertsonian translocation. It's the mother that usually has the abnormality. She only has 45 chromosomes. And her chromosome 21 is actually one chromosome with the two of them attached together. And so when she gives that to her baby, baby gets one chromosome 21 from daddy, she gives the one that has one with two, with basically our, our two together, you end up with 46, but three functioning ones. They asked that recently. And so many people screwed it up because they said, what's the mechanism? And everyone put down non-disjunction. Now, that's the one for, for abnormal number ones. The answer was Robertsonian translocation was the answer. Whoa. This kid does have have it. It's an increase. There's a brush field spots, flat bridge. And the reason I put it here is for why? Duodenal atresia. 
Remember, there's two GI diseases that kids with Downs get. One is duodenal atresia. We already mentioned that. And the other is Hirschsprung's. How are you going to recognize Hirschsprung's? Well, we'll see. Okay, here is the most common cause of obstruction. Uh, those are watermelon pits. Okay, then there's a little narrowing here. Why would they put that? Because obviously there's an obstruction here that the watermelon, pit, the watermelon pits couldn't get by. So what's the most common cause of it? Adhesions from previous surgery. And actually, this was an adhesion from previous surgery. That's the most common cause. Okay, but if they say that the patient never had surgery and they had classic colicky pain, then the answer is a, the bowels are trapped in an in, a indirect inguinal hernia. That's the second, and they did that. They did that. They did that. They did that. They said it was a male weightlifter, and he developed colicky pain. Okay, and I think they said it was down in the right lower quadrant area. And he said that he never had a history of surgery, and I said the most likely cause of his pain is, of course, they had, you know, adhesions down there that was wrong, and they did have indirect inguinal hernia. Of course, weightlifters, oftentimes lifting heavy weights, often create those things, and so it was a beautiful question, and most people got it wrong because uh, they stuck adhesions down wrong. That's from previous surgery. The answer was indirect inguinal hernia. This is Hirschsprung's down here. This is, shows the normal rectum, and you see the ganglion cells here, right over here. Okay, and this is Hirschsprung's disease. You see the nerve, but these ganglion cells here are missing. Now, of course, what's going to happen if these are missing in the rectum is that stool can't get through by. It's not that it's no, the opening's still there, but the stool can't go by. Why? There's no peristalsis there, so it just stays there, even though it's open. So what about the dilatation of the proximal colon? Does it have ganglion cells in it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, is it peristalsis? Oh, sure. And it can't get the stool through that little rectum area where there's no ganglion cells. Nope. Why? There's no peristalsis there, so it stops there. So that means that the rectal ampulla has no stool in it. Is that correct? So if you had a child that didn't pass the meconium in 24 hours, and you did a little rectal exam on with your pinky, and you stuck your finger up there, and no stool came off, what's your diagnosis? Hirschsprung's. If you did a rectal and stool came off on it, then what it is? Tight sphincter. Okay, you just basically cured it with that dilatation with your finger. That's the most common. But if there's no stool that comes off, it's Hirschsprung's. Because that means there's no stool in the rectal ampulla. That means there's a problem. Will they say stuff like that on the exam? Yes, they will. And they're kind of giving it away. Okay. Hirschsprung's. All right, intussusception. Since a lot of you don't understand that, okay, I, I put a diagram in on this. Most intussusceptions are in children, as you know. And it's where the terminal ilium intussusceps goes into the cecum. So that would be right down here, guys. Terminal ilium and cecum is right down here. So the pain's going to be here, down here, and it'll be a colicky pain because you are obstructing. Okay? Not only that, you are compromising blood flow, and so you get the, the bleeding. They're not going to say current jelly stool, guys. They're not going to say current jelly stools. They're just going to say bloody stools, colicky pain, two-year-old kid. All right? They might say if they want to, they could say there's an oblong mass in the right upper quadrant. That's called Dance's sign. Uh, that's a sign of it. Okay, so here's what's happening. It's intussuscepting. This is the terminal ilium intussuscepting. See, it's, it's getting, it's like, it's like, this is the cecum. It's like in, it's invaginating right into that. And it's just obstructing everything. Here's a gross example of that. This is terminal ilium, and it's intussuscepting into the cecum over here. Now, most of the time in kids, it spontaneously uh, uh, comes out. Uh, and if not, then you get your friendly radiologist to go and do a, a, a barium enema and put a little pressure in there, and it, and it diverts it. A very common question on part one, two, and three, intussusception. This is twisting of the, uh, of the colon around the mesentery because there's too much of it. You, of course, cite and explain this with newspaper, okay, if you had him, and this is, of course, a volvulus. This, of course, is also producing a complete obstruction, but also infarction, okay, because you're compromising the blood supply. This is gallstone ileus, usually seen in older people. This is a, a part of liver here, and here's the gallbladder here, and here's your fistula. Here's your little, here's your little fistula. And notice that what happened is the stone fell out of there, and there it is right over there. And it usually settles in the ileal sequel valve and produces obstruction. So this is something that's seen usually older women. They have signs of of colicky pain and obstruction, and you the flat plate of the abdomen. Here it is on the boards. Here it is. Flat plate of the abdomen reveals air in the biliary tree. Boom. Diagnosis, gallstone ileus. 
because you have a, 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 a fistula, a communication between the gallbladder and the small bowel now, air can get into the gallbladder and biliary tree. So air in the biliary tree with colicky pain is gallstone illness. I think that's enough. There's meconium ileus. If you see meconium ileus, what does that mean? Cystic fibrosis, that's correct. What am I doing this for? Just drink it, you moron. I even use this for taking my pills, my vitamins in the morning. I use it for gargling. I mean, I just love coffee. <laughs> Good stuff. By the way, they get that in that Barnes and Noble. It wasn't quite as good as it was in the regular Starbucks. I'm going to have to register a complaint with Kaplan. What if I contact Marcy? I'll get Marcy in Southern California. She'll make sure I get my Starbucks. All right, let's talk about vascular lesions. Are you ready? Okay, not really, but where you are now. All right, have you seen this before? Yes. When did you see it? Day one, two, three, one. Day one. Under what? Infarction. Very good. Now that was about maybe 400 slides ago. So some of you are worried about, how am I going to remember all these slides? God made us fearfully and wonderfully. And so we have incredible, incredible ability to remember pictures because we're basically visual and auditory beings. Yeah. In fact, I'll prove it to you when we do the slideshow at the end. Now, I'm going to put some slides in there, reverse of what I put them in when you saw them originally, and you'll be able to recognize it, even though it's 700 slides later. Mm -hmm. And you'll absolutely surprise yourself and say, I, I don't believe that. I actually knew that that's in the wrong line. I'll prove it. Just wait. Now, some of you will not get it, <laughs> okay? So don't go, don't do that, because that's, you get a coup contra coup concussion, okay? You don't want to do that. Okay, so this is a hemorrhagic infarction. Recall that the small bowel more commonly infarcts than the large bowel. That's an easy one. Why? One blood supply. Just a little bit past, just maybe a few inches up in the duodenum, on all the way to right here at superior mesenteric artery. Not cool. That's your entire small bowel, your ascending colon, transverse colon, and right here there's a change of command of the superior mesenteric with the inferior mesenteric. Correct? Now most people think this is a good. That's good, right? No. Why? Because most of you think that it's that you get double blood supply and everything's wonderful down right there. Wrong. It's like this. They don't go like this. They're like this. So there's a little island in there where they don't get any blood. And that's why you see pain right over here when you have ischemic disease in the colon. Right there. I got this unbelievable pain. Where? Right here. That's a no-brainer. It's ischemic colitis. Okay. Because that's the overlap area. It doesn't get enough blood supply. So uh, this is a small bowel infarct. This happens to actually have been entrapped in a small bowel and, a, and the indirect inguinal uh, hernia sac. Now, this is a, is a biopsy in a patient that did have a severe pain right here over the, a few months, and he was afraid to eat. He said, Doctor, every time, 30 minutes after I eat, I, I, I get unbelievable pain. Unbelievable pain, Doctor. Where? Right here. Okay? How about stools? Lately, I've noticed blood in my stool. Guys, that's this lesion, right at the right at the uh, at this uh, splenic flexor area, that little tiny infarction producing the bloody diarrhea. Would you notice, please, that you're starting to get almost signs of obstruction there from pre previous infarctions repair, previous infarctions repair. This is ischemic colitis. Okay, when you get a person that has a, a uh, infarction of the small bowel, here's what happens: they will uh, have a, a sudden onset of severe generalized abdominal pain, and bloody diarrhea. The whole abdomen hurts. Not just here, the whole abdomen hurts. And they have bloody diarrhea, that's a small bowel infarction. If it's, if it's, the, uh, if it's the colon, it's, the pain is here, 
with bloody diarrhea. When it's a small intestine, the entire abdomen hurts and is distended. Easy differential. Okay, let's break. <laughs>